Hello, welcome uh, to another Journeys with Jeff. Uh, I'm Jeff Grandy, your host. And uh, you guys have, um, you're familiar with the concept of, uh, you know, a, a half hour, an hour television show uh, that tells one big story. And, and uh, uh, that's not what we're going to do today because what we have today to offer you is not a story but an epic and I'm talking about a real epic journey by a man who was born in 1932 in Belitsa, Poland, a Jewish family. Uh, the family was Lazowski, the Lazowski family. Uh, his name is now Lesser, Bob Lesser. Some of you people viewing may be familiar with that name because Bob's been in the area for many, many years. Bob has had so many experiences that an hour does not do it justice at all. But what we're going to do today is we're going to try to encapsulate in, in an hour the one little piece of his epic. And, that, and it's not a little piece, it's a big piece. But uh, in, in, uh, in Germany, uh, during Hitler's reign, the, of course, you know what happened uh, with the Jewish the population of the Holocaust, you're all familiar with that. Bob experienced that. Bob lived through that and with his family. And today, he's going to talk about how he and his family survived and what they did to escape the Nazis and what they did to survive. So I want to welcome today Bob Lesser. Bob, welcome to Journeys with Jeff. Thank and you are going to talk today about the amazing, the absolutely amazing story of how your family survived and escaped from the Nazis, along with a lot of other Jewish families, too. T bring us, tell us, start off with your, you were telling me earlier, with your grandfather, how your grandfather prepared you to survive, and then actually what happened when you escaped when they burned your house down. Tell us about that. My grandfather came, he went to, to America in the early 1900s, uh, 1917 and 1916, to create a family and a business there, and then take the family to the United States. My grandmother got sick, so he sold all the business and the, and the house, and he came back to Belissa, Poland, to see how he can help his, his wife. But unfortunately, she died before I was born, and he was lonesome, and I was very close to my grandfather, so I used to stay with him in his house, and then he said to me, I'm going to teach you languages. So he taught me around seven languages, every week a different language. Then he said to me, I will take you into the woods to prepare you for the future, how to survive. He wouldn't tell me yet how, why, because I was too young. I was only four and a half years old, four, four and a half, going on five. But he did take me to the woods, like 4.30, 5 in the morning, and he said to me, these mushrooms are no good to eat. This one is a barvik, that's a good one. This one is a dushnitsi, that's a yellow one, that's good. And how to take soap, soap juice out of a barozovic tree, it's a white tree, and you, you poke an, a hole in there, you put a bucket in the bottom, and it drips in juice to survive, he can drink it. And how to pick certain grass to eat, so you can have energy. And then, later on in the years, I found out when Hitler came in, in 1941, because Stalin made a deal with Hitler you, I'll take Warsaw and Lodz and all the other big cities in Poland, and you'll take where I was born in Belize, 
It was actually Belarus and was all mixed up. So Stalin took over in 1938, and then it became Russia. So we were not allowed to learn the study the Bible, or, or so we had to have a special teacher to come into the house, close the shades, and put on put on a a, a candle, and the all the, the youngest one we had five children. My firstborn, the firstborn was Fievel. I was the second one, Yerachmel. I didn't have no middle name because God was in front of my name. The youth, instead of calling me Rachmel, they called me Irachmel. Number three was Abraham. Number four was Aaron. And number five was my sweetheart, Princess Rochale. My, my beautiful do, uh, sister. So there were four sons and one daughter. And now uh, and my, my, my mother was pregnant for another one. All right, now uh, I want you to go, go forward now from what your grandfather taught you with the, what to, how to survive in the woods. Right. Now what, ha what happened, how many years later was it when they burned your house down? Two years later, 1939, like I said, Stalin took over. 1941, Hitler came in, in around June, or so, give, give or take. And the first thing he came in, he had prepared to kill all the Jews and burn their homes so they wouldn't have to have a, a home at all. So they can be like gypsies, live in the woods or, or whatever, or kill them. So the neighbors was, we found out later, they were unfriendly. So they pointed out, Zhebek, that means the Jew's house. And in, in Belize, everybody had straw houses, roofs, the straw. So it was very simple. That particular German was very tall. He must have been around seven foot or more. And he had a stick with a, with a burning torch. And he went to each corner to burn our house while we were in the house, all of us. And my grandmother, my, my mother's, my father's mother, was in a duplex house next to us. So we can walk right through and visit my, my grandmother. Any event, the doors were all shut. We didn't have a chance to take anything with us. So my father pushed one of the doors on the side and we all escaped safely without anything taken with us. Whatever my mother had with her, on her, she grabbed and we ran. And we were with small children, especially my younger brother and my sisters, my sister. And we went to the Nyaman River. My father had a business. We had a maid in the house too, incidentally, because my mother had a different business of a, sto a manufacturer's store, you can buy any material and you make your clothes, your suits, your draperies, whatever you wish, and she used to sell you by the yard. And my father had 12 men working for him, and they owned the Nyaman River three miles long, and he paid Polish Podaskas. That means he paid Polish taxes to the Polish government. And by that time, when the, the Russians took over and the Germans took over, he remembered those men, 12 men that worked for him, and, and we, they built a cave about 30 feet down next to the house with a roof over it, and we had ice in there all year around we had fish in the ice, and they were all alive. So when my 
my father was selling fish to all the different towns and cities. And the gentleman that worked for my father lived in Zblan, that's a little uh, village, and other surrounding areas they lived. And my, my grandfather, I forgot to tell you, that had a, a place with three castles around copper, and he, I used to go and help him make the fire on the bottom when I was four and a half years old, five years old, and he heated up the, the bells of the copper, three, and he put in dye. It was red, green, and blue. The farmers used to cut the wool from the sheep and bring it to my grandfather, and they used to dye it for them in different colors. Most of the farmers paid him. I said to him, I was with him all the time. I was very close to him of this teaching that he prepared me for, like I told you. And I said, Grandpa, how come this farmer didn't pay you? He says, Irachmeel, don't worry about the poor people. They have a conscience. When they have the money, they'll pay me back faithful to fly him. They'll pay me more than I deserve. Watch out for the rich people. I says, why? They got money. Oh, no. They'll find fault. This is wrong. That's wrong. I'm going to pay you what I think it's worth. So I said to him, Grandpa, you know what I'm thinking? Next time, when the rich people come to you, tell them the price is so much. Then when they cut you down, you'll have what you deserve. He says, see, I'm teaching you good things. Now you're learning. <laughs> you, I, and my family were always smart. Look what Stalin did. He picked my uncle to go in the Kremlin because he heard them teach the farmers they couldn't read or write because they worked from sun up to sun down. So they didn't have no schooling. So he was teaching them while he was in prison because he was very educated. My, my old family are educated. We had, your, your uncle was, he was in prison with Stalin? Right. During the Bolshevik Revolution? Right, because I, I, I'll, I'll explain you how that happened. He was very smart, and he revoked, like Stalin did. And you would do probably the same. So would I, maybe, you know. So they put him in prison. Stalin was in the corner, listening to my uncle, how he was teaching the farmers how to read, how to write, how to do arithmetic. He said, that's the man that I need with me. He figured, and he was writing notes. Do you know how he was writing notes? My uncle told my father. He cut himself in the blood. He was writing notes to the Bolsheviks that this and this and that. Now, when my, my uncle was in the Kremlin, Molotov married a Jewish woman. My uncle was very friendly with her. So they used to send messages to New York. He was a Zionist, so was I. The roots are still there. You cannot kill the roots. You can kill the people, but the roots always survive. It's a very difficult thing to say. The touch of my mother will always be within me. A flower you can give, you can smell it, but it'll die. The gift of a flower is not a touch of your mother. Because the love that my mother taught me and gave me will always be within me. And I try to teach my beautiful daughter, Cindy, and my other daughter, Debbie, 
and my son Matthew and my six grandchildren that I have. I, I'm very fond of my five boys and one princess. My firstborn, I told them, be somebody. Don't go into bars and drink. Don't hang out on the, on the corners with friends. Study. Be somebody. I didn't study because I memorized things. When I, got to, when I went to school, I memorized. I listened to the teacher. Jeff, if you're my teacher and you give me everything that's in you, why would I deny you? I would respect you and have a great admiration for you because you're teaching me something that I don't know. But the experience that I went through living with the Nazis controlling us I'll never forget. Well, and um, nobody can tell me it was never there. Yeah, I know. It's are, are sad that those, those theories are out there, but, you know, uh, all kinds of deniers of everything. But uh, let's go back to after they burned your house, your father and your mother took you and your siblings down to the river. Right, the Yemen River. And then what... What did you do after? What did they? What did you do there? The reason why my father did it, because he knew the fishermen that worked for him would probably be there and try to help us, and it so happened. They were there fishing, and they took us to a shelter to hide us. Then. They took and back to, back to the house was burned and there was nothing there. My father let the cow out. We had a cow that I used to milk. My mother taught me how to do it. You know, it's an art. Otherwise, the cow can kill you, kick you with the back feet. <laughs> So you, <laughs> you have to learn all the things. I used to help my mother make a garden, and I know how to do it, you know. But the farmers helped my father. But my grandfather's house was never burned. Let me explain to you. He was so good to the farmers all around the area. Zblan, uh, Novgorod, Lida, every little town and village, even if you didn't live in a village, lived on a farm. Ten years later, don't worry. You, you're going to have a good three months later, you'll have more things. You come back. If you don't have it this year, then the next year. And they had a hard gold. And I copy him. I do the same what my grandfather does. Help somebody, then you get careful to fly him. God will look over you. And and I and I, I believe that a wholehearted very it's very close to my heart. It's very difficult to explain to to anybody, Jeff, but you know. You've been around for a long time, and you had people that you associate with, and this and that. But afterwards, they took, we went back to my grandfather's house, and we stayed with him. So they took 18 people on one side, 18 people on the other side, the Germans did. And, they went, they, and the German soldiers, went up and they went like this. So they touched each other. 18 Germans on one side and 18 Germans on the other side. And what they did, they took my uncle Mendel, the one that escaped from Poland 
from, from Russia, when they killed all the, in 1939, he came to our, our town because they killed his, ma his wife and kids. And he was born in Belize, my uncle Mendel. So he came back to live with us. So they took him, my father, and other people that they grabbed, and they let him run in the middle. What the Germans did, there were wooden fences on the church and other places. So they ripped up the, bird, the, the wooden uh, pickets, and the nails were stuck to the wooden fences, the wooden, and they had them run. And they were swinging that with the nails to hit each person. Those that were run quick, they put the foot on so they can fall and then hit them. Some of them didn't survive. They made us little kids watch. You know what else they did bad? A friend of mine whose name is Irving. He was 15 years old, and I was only nine, eight, nine years old. They took his beautiful sister. She had red hair, and the hair was galocta hair, not straight, but beautiful, long hair up to her neck. They put her in a barn. There's 18 Germans, like I told you. They did a dishonest thing with her, if you know what I mean. Each and every one. Then they took her clothes off. Then they tied her hands in back. Then they cut her breast halfway and put salt on it and let her walk in the middle of the market. That Irving said that he'll take Nekome. That means he will never forget that and he'll do justice. When in the woods, when we were in the woods, Mr. Jeff, you know what he did? He came back, he went alone. Didn't was afraid, he went alone into the farm, farmers, into the villages at night. He never went during the day. At night they drink, they have ayer, speck, putter, you know, that speck means uh, like uh, bacon and ham. The Germans like that. While they were running with the, with the, ho with the horse and, 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 uh, and wagon, from one place to another place, they used to have the, the, the wagon with the horses. He jumped him back. The Russian used to shave with a blade that opens up, then you take a belt and you make a sharp. You know the kind? Not like today, they have the little razors, but a long one like that opens up. He cut the throat. He says, it's no good to wait a, waste a bullet on them. What they did to my sister and my, and my father and mother, he, was, he, left, he lived all by himself. Thank God that he didn't kill himself like other kids I used to see hang themselves because they couldn't take it. You know what I mean? They couldn't take it. So what he did, so I said to him, Irving, come on, you didn't kill no Germans and cut their throat. What the, you must have killed a sheep and you got blood all over you. He says, Bob, I couldn't take off my be the belt. When I cut their throat, the belt swell up because they have a, a buckle, got with horns, and it buckles in. You know, it doesn't have like the holes like I have. I said, listen, the razor that you had, you could have cut it. Next time you brought five, next time you brought seven, 
belts around his neck. I, I cut him, I cut the throat. You see, so, the General Korka used to come into our camp. He used to go out at night and find the Germans where they are, kill them, and then a whole night he had his voice with him, and then he come back to our camp to sleep. He looked at me, he looked at my father, and he says to, to me, what is your name? I says, Irachmiel Lazovsky. You the Lozovsky? That means Stalin? I said, Tochna in Russian. That's right. Remember, I told you my grandfather taught me all those languages, that I was prepared, I was prepared to, to speak these languages. So he said to me, Let me show you my machine gun that's 72 bullets. I'm going to sleep underneath the big tree. And you stay in front of me, with the, and I give you the gun, he wrapped around me, with the, with the, because he was a big man, and the leather strap. Anybody goes near me, because everybody wants to be a general. Kill him. I says, I'll do that. So I had the machine gun on, I had my right hand on the trigger, and I watched him sleeping, because I slept during the night. You know, I was okay. He said to my father, I want to take your son as a decoy. He said, what do you mean, as a, you take my son as a decoy? He knows how to dance. He plays music with the comb. He knows how to, how, how to sing. He knows how to do all these things. He'll go into the villages or to the farmers. He's be, he's be dressed just like he knows how to pray in the, in the, in the in Russian. I learned all that. So I, I pray like a Gentile. Understand? My father said, I lost two sons. I lost my daughter. I lost my wife that she was pregnant eight months. I only got two left, Fivel and Rachmiel. Oh, Mishka, he called me Mishka. He didn't call me, he didn't call me Lazovsky, or he didn't call me Rachmiel. So I said, okay, Mishka. My father says, you're not taking him. He said, I'm a general. My brother is Lazovsky. You're gonna, you're gonna find out if I tell you no, he says, Pajarista, he says, please forgive me. I don't, I'm, I, I'm not going to take him. But he would be an asset to kill more Germans. Bob, how did you get from, after they burned your house down, the Nazis lined up and they beat everybody? Right. And then how did you get from there to your camp, to a camp? Okay. Where you, were, where you were safer. Okay, they ordered us to leave Belissa or you're going to be killed. So my, being that my father said that he can do a trade, they said, okay, you cannot stay in Belissa. Either go to Lida or to Jettel. So my mother said, We'll go to Jettel. And we went to Jettel. So we, 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 whatever my grandfather had left in his house, we went with him, my uncle Mendel, and my tante Leah, and we went, all of us with the kids, to Jettel. We went to Jettel, and they put us in a ghetto. So then, we were all barred in in the ghetto, you know, in, in, in Jettel. So those that can work, 
they separated those that can work, they gave us cards out. Those that didn't work, they took them to a place that we're not supposed to know. You can figure it out yourself. My father used to go out of the, the ghetto and work for a farmer that made meal, you know, he, um, uh, for bread. It's a, a meal mark, a meal thing for, make, for making that. For, so he was working there a whole day, and then in the, late in the, in the evening, they let him come in because he had a pass. And that they allowed him to go out to work and then come in. Sometimes he was working outside for days and didn't come in because they, they needed him to do the work. Then the Germans said they made somebody in charge, like a mayor, you know. So Jeff became a mayor. You came with a big car things and you said, listen, the Germans want gold and diamonds. Otherwise, they're going to start killing us. So each one had uh, rings, necklaces, earrings. So they gave it in the big pushka. Then they gave it to the Germans. And they said, OK, you let you survive. You're going to stay here. And then then the, those, those group of Germans went further somewhere, and a new group came in. They demanded gold again, and diamonds, and this, and that. So they killed, they, they made a pogrom, and they killed half of the, of, of the people in the, in the ghetto. Those that survived and cleaned up, because the people ran. So they ran this way, that way. So the whole group were on top of each other, and they, and they were all murdered. Is that where you lost your mother and father? Did they, no. did they die there? No, no, no. We were very lucky. Underneath, when we lived in, in that house, we had a big closet with two doors that you hang close. The bottom, my father cut out, and he cut out the, the wooden floor. And underneath was a cave. So we could all lay in there. And then when we, we close, we, we take back the, the thing, we close it down. We first, we closed the two doors. See, nobody can look in the closet. There's a hole in there. And, and, and we had, that was in the winter time. And I went out there with my aunt Leah at night, like 2.30 in the morning. They all, the Germans sleep. We had to cross the road underneath the wire, go in where they turn a rope with a, with, a, with a pail and get the water. And there was all ice all around. I was cold like a son of a gun, very cold. And we took the water and we brought it down to my, my Zaydi. My, my grandfather can, can drink it because he used to cough all the time. You know, a lot of dust from that uh, in the basement, I mean, in the cave down below the ground there underneath the house, and spider webs and all that, you know. So it wasn't so comfortable. And if you move a little, the dust comes up. So you can't help by coughing. We were laying there for weeks underneath. And that was the last time when they made Juden Rhein kill everybody. Those that were lucky to escape, fine. Those that couldn't escape, they shot him right there, or they take him in a big pickup truck, big big truck. They bring him to a kino, where they used to have movies, you know, play. So that was empty. 
So they brought them there and they nailed all the windows with, so nobody can escape. And then they take him truck by truck to a place where there's a gully and they machine gun them. So that's where they took my grandfather, my mother, my two brothers, and my little sister, and my mother was pregnant. The reason why they didn't kill her right away, like others they did, my father and I used to take the sheet off the bed, fold it together. I used to hold it on the end. My father said, breathe in, and she breathed in, and he wrapped it around her, and she turned the white sheet and then put the dress over her so the Germans wouldn't see that she's pregnant. The kids never knew that my mother was pregnant because there was a secret. And they asked the kids, is your mother pregnant? They take her with other pregnant women. They bring her to a gully. And they machine gun them. And that's it. How did you and your brother and your father survive when your mother and your other uh, brothers and sister, uh, they were killed? How did you and your father uh, avoid that, escape that? Okay. <clears throat> My father was, like I told you, was working outside in a mill place that the Germans had him go and work. When he found out that they were killing everybody in the ghetto, he couldn't come in. No matter who comes out or comes in, they machine gun you. They make it human rhyme. They clean all the Jews out, kill them. No savings for no card will save you nothing. My aunt and my uncle was with us, like I told you, in the cave. Two or three o'clock in the morning, we were all sleeping, and they went out and escaped into the woods. After we were laying there, no food, no drinks, no nothing, and we were he he listening to all the shooting and all the machine guns and all the people, the neighbors and the farmers, whoever that lived around the area, came in when the Germans got through killing in the afternoon or in the evening or early in the morning. We heard them talking to each other and zhidek and zhidek and stealing all the clothes that we had in the, inside the house. We heard the footsteps coming in. They were drinking and, and talking dirty talk about the Jews and this and that. Yavrei is dochneskarei, means that your Jew is gonna die soon, sooner and all this. Ah. But After a while, we were all asleep. A, a company of, of, of uh, those do-gooders that were doing for the Germans came into the house, sitting at the table, drinking, and they must have fallen asleep. In the morning early, my grandfather started to cough. And it's so quiet, you can hear even a, a fly running. They started to holler, oh, Zhidek, they're going to go and get the Germans. We heard them. And they went for the Germans. My mother grabbed me. She says, Irachmel, do you denkst what you have to exact? Do you remember what I told you? I says, yeah. To, to be happy, to sing, to, to dance, to be freilach, to survive, 
and to tell you gotta tell what the goslin is doing. That means I should never kill myself, I should be happy, I should sing, I should help other people to be like my Zaidi, like be like my Tati, you grand you grand you Zaidi. And she and I remember how the exact words what she told me. And she says, promise me, Zog at the stone with your Zog there. I shouldn't hang myself. I shouldn't kill myself. I should stop others from doing that. You need to survive and tell the world. Even if you tell to one person, she says to me, then you tell the whole world. One person makes a difference. So I respected my mother, and I promised her, oh, she wrapped around my neck a little thing with a bottle, and she put her marriage, her marriage ring and five, ten dollar ruble gold pieces. She says, you saved your life. Germans like gold. So when they catch you, you give it them, they let you go. I said, well, I can't take that from you. She said, you must. I want you to survive. I cannot go nowhere. I'm pregnant. I have my, my, three, my two kids. Abraham was already shot in the head before we went in, in the cave. So Alan and Rochelle was with her. She says, I have to stay with her, with, with them. You can survive. I want you to have it. Don't refuse me when I ask you. I said, okay. Tears came out of me. And I didn't say nothing. I said, I'll do what you asked me. And that was the last thing I, I, she pushed me out of the, the cave, and she says, Kia rein, abu me gate, number eins, number three. I listened to her. That was around eight o'clock in the morning, or eight thirty. I jumped in, in number one. And number two, nobody cleaned it ever. Maggots were that big, white and yellow maggots up to my ear. I was holding God not to drown myself. Dead rats. And that, it was un <laughs> cannot describe. I was laying there from 8 o'clock in the morning until 2.30 in the morning when I didn't hear any more noise and talking, you can write a book, what I heard, how they talked about Jews and how the killings and the stealing and all this dirty talk, unpleasant that I don't like to talk about it because it's, it's bad. At 2.30 in the morning, I didn't hear no more noise. And I got out of it, number one and number two. And I took off whatever I had on, and I was shivering. You can hear my, my teeth knocking against each other. And my Zaydi said to me when I was years ago with him, 
in order to keep warm, you keep rubbing yourself and move exercise and move around. Otherwise, you freeze to death. So I did it. I remember when my lady told me, and I did it. And I come cl closer to the gate, I heard footsteps. I guess the German NKVD, the SS troop, the gate, they were across from that, why that gate that I came by? So I I listen, I listen to them, and then I had the footsteps getting much sm small, quieter. So I said, oh, I couldn't look through. I I didn't want him to see me, so I was crawling on my on my on my hands and then I listened and didn't hear no more footsteps. So I went closer to the gate and I I was all so close to the gate that all of a sudden I started hearing footsteps again. So what it was, he was watching that building that the Germans were sleeping because some young men came in from the woods and they were shooting from inside the ghetto. So they figured there may be some left. So the guard, the German guard with his rifle walking, but by the time he turned the other side of the building, I didn't hear his footsteps anymore. So I crawled underneath, don't forget, I only weighed 39 pounds. My stomach was touching my back bones. That's how I was so, so I could crawl in the, in, and I ran quick across, this, across the thing. And then I went across, there was a little brook. I heard running water. And then I, I saw some garbage cans halfway covered with, with metal things. So first what I did, I, I washed my hands and I w so I, I won't s smell so bad. You know, I, I, it was, I, 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 I smell terribly. I, I can kill by smelling. <laughs> Any event, I, I washed my, 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 my feet because I had nothing on. I took everything off. It was terrible. And I washed myself and I, the best I can. And I went to the garbage can and I saw the shawlachs, the skin from raw potatoes. And I didn't eat for days. See, so the first thing that I did, I washed my hands. I drank the water from the brook was running water. Ice was on the side, you know, but in the, in the thing was still running water and I drank. Then what I did, I, I went to the garbage can and I saw that shells from the potatoes raw and I ate it. Oh, was that nice and sweet, the, the raw potatoes. And then I got a hole on myself and then I started walking. At night was the one close to three, three, maybe a quarter after three in the morning. And the moon was out, but I had to be careful. Uh, so I, I was walking into the, into the farmer's woods there, you know, like they had corn, corn it was high, about five, five feet high. So I, I went in there and I ate some of the corn and got stuck in my throat because I couldn't, I was so desperate, hungry, you know. Then I went into the to the farmer, that that the, and I and I knocked in the door, and he said to me, "Get the heck out of here! They're gonna kill me and kill you together. I cannot have you. Get the hell out of here, or I'll, or I'll kill you." I says. 
Wait a minute. I told them, Padarjiche Pajalista. Wait a minute. In, in, the, in Russian, he says, What are you talking about? I should wait a minute. I want to explain you who I am. Ya Yishwari Bayanuk, Fabelnik, Israel, Alperman. Ooh, T, you look. For the Pabelnik, you are the grandson. Tak Tochna. Ya Bil Patsan, I was a little boy when I was with him. Hadishuda, come with me. He put me in the barn. He gave me clean clothes. Oh, that was like a million and a half dollars. Then he gave me milk and a piece of bread looked like a piece of cake. And I ate that and he covered me in the hay with my clothes. He gave me nice clothes, warm. And he gave me, a, he made from leather, some kind of a, a from the animal, a, like a shoe with string. And he gave me some rags first, and I and I put it on, and I I laid in in the hay. In the morning, he gave me more food, and he says, "Listen, I love you, your grandfather." He was a good man. But I, I, if they find out you're here, I said, well, where can I go? Where is my people? He says, you got to go to Dvoretz. I said, Yan Yisnayu. I didn't know where Dvoretz is. He says, but there's Jiche. I said, wait a minute. Right? Uh, is, is, Make for me a, 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 a map, and I'll follow. So he made a sketch, how to go this way and that way, and then you ask somebody, they, they all know your grandfather. That, so I did. I went, a guy on a motorcycle, on a bicycle, caught me. He says, So I went over. You know, uh, uh, what, what do you want? I want to take you to uh, a place. I says, no, nah, I'm going to my farm. What farm? Uh, uh, I says, not, not my diala, not your business. I don't want to tell him, no, because I look like he's a spy or something. He says, no, you got to come with me. So you put me on, on the, it's not a woman's bicycle, it's a man's. So you put me on the thing. So I says, uh, he, he was riding him down the road. And I said to him, I need to go to Isdiavayu. That I got to do what, what, what the men do. And uh, he let me down. And he, he was trying to put the thing on his bicycle to, to, to hold the bicycle down. And then he turned, and, and I saw what the right place was to stop, because I told him I have to go. And there was deep woods, deep, you know, good. And I, and I said to him, uh, and I said to him, my arm to hold, you know, and he turned to me, and my Zaidi told me, no matter how you, you do it, I'll show you how to do something good. He, he prepared me real good. The Lord is good to me, with my Zaidi. How old were you? How old were you then at this time? Nine, nine and a half. You were nine and a half? About, and about, you, about yeah, nine, I was born in 1932. So eight, nine, yeah, about nine, a little after. And I gave him a zetz with my right foot in the, in the good place. Yeah. 
I don't want to mention it. And he went, he went down, and, the, and I pegged the bicycle on him, and I ran into the woods. He was screaming. He couldn't run after me. I think I made a feinkochen. You know what I mean? Scrambled eggs I made. Would you, would you ever, did you ever see your brother or your father again? Let me explain to you. Finally, with all this business and running and escaping, then I got hungry, so I went to another farm after the woods. I went into the woods and he couldn't kiss me. He was already, I ran like a son of a gun. I can run 35 miles an hour. Oh yeah, I can run good. Believe me. I went to another farmer that was a, a, like a club. One house here, one house there, one house, like a surrounding with houses with farmers. I went in there and I asked for food. A young man comes out with a weight. The, the, the way the ball was that big with iron. And the end was markers with a hook. And you weigh the weight, you know, and tells you how much. He wanted to hit me and kill me. But my Zadie, I told you, it prepared me for a lot of things. I went and I went and I got him the right way. His mother come out of the house. Shtosta boyu, she said to him. What's wrong with you? Let that young boy go. I gave him back the weight and I ran away. I saw another guy that knew my grandfather. He told me there's Jews in there, how to go there. He made them a thing and I went. What did I do? I walked right in to another camp. It's a slave camp, Drohats. I, I go in there and they put me to work. They had a, a big thing on, on a, like a railroad, the, the, you know, the lines. They were building railroad tracks for, for the, the railroad tracks when they send food from, from Germany by plane, they put it on the railroad tracks and they go to Stalingrad. So I was working with Ted Weinstone. He, he was older than me and was younger. So he was telling me how to do it. And, and he says, don't try to overdo it because you can ruin your, 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 the thing come back on you going up the hill you can ruin your leg. So he was right. I tried to show off, put in more stones and push it up the hill and it went back on me. So I almost lost my leg. See, it hit me so bad. I didn't hear, see? Yeah. It's very hard to hear all those years. My doctor said I can lose my leg, but I take care of it and my daughter helps me. Well, Any Bob, event. Bob. Uh, we, we were we we only have a minute left. Okay. How are how are so, you finally rescued? Okay. While I was working with Ted Weinstone outside the camp in the dwarfs, and I was talking to the farmers. Slushashe Pajalista, Ya is desh Yivu, Ya Razovsky, Skazichit Partizans, Ya Yivu that. The German got mad at me. What are you talking? So Teddy Weinstone said, that man she's verrückt, that I'm crazy, I'm talking to myself. And I'm a good arbiter. I got that I'm a good worker. So he took the gun, put it back. At Teddy Weinstone, wouldn't speak for me, I'd probably be dead. So he was with me all the time, and I used to sing and dance, make everybody happy. The message came in to my uncle in the woods, my father, and my aunt, my aunt Leah. The meanwhile, after I'd been there establishing 
you know, talk to the farmers that I'm, 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 I'm alive, I live here, and they send messages to the partisans in the woods. Three, four, five days later, who walks into the camp? Fido, my brother. And we hug each other and kiss each other and we cried and we laughed. A day later, my uncle Mendel comes in with a pet, with a, a, a horse trader. He knew the way. He was about 75 years old. He knew every way how the woods and the farmers were to go. His name was Mishka the Kanuch. That's his name. Kanuch means horse trader. And he guided my uncle Mendel to come into the camp at 2.30 in the morning. He came in with a gun and grenade. We took a shower after work. I said to my uncle, we cannot escape tonight at 2.30. He says, Favos Rachmiel, that man is not gemild. It was another guy that had taken a shower. People before was escaping, they were machine gunned. This guy was not circumcised. What are you doing here? This is supposed to be a slave camp. When did you find I, I When I was in the shower with, with my uncle Manzel and the Meshka the Kanuch, I looked around to recognize somebody, to look. So I look up and down. My Zaydi says, stay close to your friends but stay closer to your enemies. I said, Zaydi, why would I want to stay close to my enemies? So you'll know what they're up to. So when, my Zaydi, when did you finally get free? My uncle, then I said no, to my uncle. Wait, tell me when you finally got free. Yeah, I said to my uncle, let's escape the next night, not in the same place in a different, and we'll go to 33 o'clock in the morning. And we did it. And you made it. And, you and we made it. Wow. And we walked into the woods. Ah, I was yeah, in heaven. I'll bet you. Ah. Come back. Uh, we're, 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 we're out of time. Ah. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Bob Lesser for, uh, I don't think this needs any editorializing. This is a, an amazing account of an amazing survival that's, and uh, the, uh, it's just beyond words to uh, imagine what kind of trauma, traumatic experience that has to have been for everybody who was, who was uh, there in, 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 in the Holocaust. Uh, I want to thank Bob and I'm going to ask him, I'm going to invite him to come back again soon uh, to continue. He's got so many more stories to tell. This is just one story of the saga, the great epic journey of his life, Bob Lesser. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.